Today's discussion is uh, particularly relevant. I think it's uh, sort of ironic as the city is girding itself for uh, NATO uh, and the Northern Atlantic that we're focused, uh, at least this afternoon, on the Southern Pacific, uh, where there is so much activity and, uh, and, and really so many interesting developments, opportunities, and, and challenges, as I think we'll hear from Alessandro. Uh, despite the recession, most of the economies in Asia uh, continued to, 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 to grow, uh, and I think we'll look forward to hearing uh, Mr. Pio's perspectives on the, really the, the drivers of growth behind Asia's economic transformation. As I think many of you know, for uh, 17 centuries, the majority of global economic activity was concentrated in Asia. The emergence of Asia is really the reemergence of Asia, and the expectation that uh, we'll see a majority of economic activity concentrated in Asia once again. Uh, but that's not something that is inherently going to happen uh, quickly or without some uh, diversions and, and challenges, and I think we'll hear more about that and really the prospects for Asia as we look ahead to the 21st century. You, everyone has a, a bio of Mr. Pio on your chairs, but uh, before introducing him, let me just uh, mention briefly mention a few of his accomplishments. He was appointed as the Director General of the North American Office of the Asia Development Bank in May of 2011. He began at the bank almost 20 years ago, and his career there has included posts as the head economist for Sri Lanka and the Maldives and senior advisor in the budget, personnel, and management systems department. Also as the ADB's country director for Sri Lanka, Mr. Pio helped the coordination of post-tsunami reconstruction among eight agencies in the region. Before the ADB, Mr. Pio taught macroeconomics and development economics for nine years in Milan and worked with the Economic Commission for Latin America and UNICEF in Latin America. Uh, Mr. Pio had been an economics professor at uh, Bocconi University and then thought he'd uh, take his skills from the classroom and see what really happened, what happened in the real world, and uh, has been a tremendous success in applying all of his knowledge and learning. Uh, he has a, a degree from Bocconi University, uh, and just to round out his rather impressive global credentials uh, throughout Asia, throughout Europe, he did a brief stint, stint uh, getting a master's degree at the University of Texas in Austin, so uh, that certainly established his uh, authentic American credentials. So with that, uh, please join me in welcoming Alessandro Pio. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Leroy, for your kind introduction, and sincere thanks to the Chicago Global Council for giving me this opportunity to talk a little bit about Asia. Uh, as Mr. Troy mentioned, my background is largely in uh, academic teaching development economics, and then for the last 20 years, practicing what I was teaching at the Asian Development Bank. And so our perspective as a development bank is a medium-term and long-term perspective. We don't typically look at the next quarters returns because the kind of investment we make pay returns in 5, 10, 20, sometimes 50 years. So uh, what I would like to do is for the next hour or so between my presentation and your question and answers, I would like to give you a vacation from your worries of this week or this month of this year and take you with me on a fast forward trip to about 2050, which is the subject of this study the Asian Development Bank did. Uh, and see what Asia might look like in 2050, but also what it will take for it to look like that, because it's not at all a given conclusion that that will happen. Now, whether 2050 is a long time away or not a long time away, I leave it to you to judge, but just for your appreciation, you might remember that as that is 30 years in the future, 30 years ago in 1974, the Chicago Global Council was celebrating its 52nd anniversary, uh, the first OPEC oil embargo just ended, and as a result of that, Latin American countries were embarking on the borrowing spree that would lead them to the then the debt crisis and the lost decade of the 80s. Uh, 
Motorola started marketing their Dynatac telephone, which was a portable telephone that weighed about 2.2 pounds, was on sale for the uh, price of $3,995, and was affectionately called the brick by the users because of its size and heft. And the World Wide Web was still 20 years away before having a more widespread affirmation. And then last but not least, I was then 21 years old, and that's the year that I met my wife, who, uh, who the, it wasn't my wife at the time, she's here now, and uh, I, think that was, I think that was probably one of the best things that happened in 1974, because we've now been married 34 years and still counting. So if you look at it from that perspective, 38 years, actually a lot of things can happen in, in that time horizon. And so I would like you to step away from your worries today and think a little bit about that. Uh, now, most of the things that I'll be talking about are based on scenarios and, and, and projections. So, you know, you'll have to excuse if, of course, none of these projections get, are extremely accurate because as you go further into the future, your, your sort of breadth diverges and the likelihood of being in a higher low scenario changes. But nevertheless, I think they give us, they're all based on realistic assumption and can give us enough of a feel of, of where the, the Asia is. So let's start with the start point, which is today. Today, Asia has a population of 4.2 billion people. It's about 60% of the world population. Uh, but the region only accounts for less than 30% of the world GDP. So 50% of the population, 28% of the GDP at the moment. And at the moment, Asia, even though many people, when they think of poverty, think of Africa, at the moment, Asia is really the home of 2 thirds of the world poor. If you count people living on less than a dollar and 25 a day, uh, about 900 million people living on that income live in Asia. So that is one of the great challenges for the continent and one of the challenges to which our institution is particularly called to respond. However, Asia has also been growing on average for the last 10 or 20 years at something like 7% per year. Of course, we know China has been one of the main motors behind it, but even if you forget China, countries like India in recent period, countries like Vietnam, countries like Indonesia, now the Philippines. There is a whole host of countries that actually have been chalking up fairly impressive growth rates. Even Afghanistan, even though we know that it's a very peculiar and distorted situation, has been growing at about 9% per year for the last 10 years. So it's been a region that has been growing at 7% per year. If we project its population and its capital stock and based on a standard production function, what its output will be, we see that by 2050, Asia will account for 50% of the world population, so 10% less than it does today, but it will account for 50% of the world income, which basically tells you that Asia will be on average, on the average world income. And if we measure in terms of purchasing power par parity, which is a, a way of measuring that accounts for exchange rate uh, misalignments, uh, the per capita income in Asia would be $41,000, which is the per capita income of the Eurozone today. So they may not wish to be exactly where the Eurozone is at that moment, but in terms of level of per capita income, this is the continent we're looking at 38 years from now. And I think that's, that's an important thing to think, our starting or any point. Now, this will happen if this transition is properly managed. And properly managed to us at Asian Development Bank, as I said, our objective is poverty reduction in Asia, poverty reduction to be achieved through what we call inclusive and sustainable growth. And I would underline both elements, inclusive and sustainable, and I'll talk about those in a moment, because those two are really the key characteristics that growth has to have in Asia for Asia to be able to be where it could be uh, 38 years from now. Uh, we don't have too much time, so I would like to highlight just four of the many challenges that Asia faces in, our, in my brief talk today. Uh, the first one would be the challenge of climate change. Because whether or not we realize it, the battle for climate change will be won or will be lost in Asia, and we will see why. And therefore, issues of energy intensity, issues of commodity intensity in the production process in Asia and how they play out in that region will be critical to the way the whole climate change outcome shapes up. Second, and linked to that, is the challenge of urbanization. Between now and 2050, 1.5 billion people will move from rural areas to urban areas in Asia. 
that is six times the population of the United States moving from rural areas to urban areas. The shape, so much of Asia's urban structure is not there yet. The shape that urban structure takes will literally cast into concrete the energy consumption, the production patterns that Asia will endure for the century after that. And therefore, the way urbanization takes shape in Asia <coughs> will determine a lot, not only of their future, but also of ours. Third element, the demographic transition. Now, when many of us think of Asia, and especially of countries like the Philippines, where our headquarters is based, we think of a very youthful region, a country full, a region full of people in relatively low, the low range of the age spectrum. But the reality of it is that if we take the dependency ratio, which is the ratio of people above 65 to the ratio of people 14 to 65, so basically if we use the old definition, the retired people as a ratio of the working age population, uh, this ratio will triple in India between now and then. It will quadruple in China between now and then. And by 2050, this ratio will exceed, will be in China, will be comparable to the way it is in Europe today. And we all think of Europe as an aging continent. We don't think of Asia in those terms, but that's the way it's going to be, at least in some countries in 2050. Now, the good thing about the, that is that that dependency ratio will no longer be as meaningful as it was some time back, because the idea that people retire at 65 and are no longer productive is, no, is an idea of the past. There was no, as you know, their time at age of 65 were established by Bismarck when the average life expectancy was 64. So that put their social security system on a pretty food safe footing. But, but it's not the way, it's not gonna be the way it is anymore. So this concept will, will lose some of its meaning, but nevertheless, I think it does give us an appreciation of how rapid this demographic transition is gonna be. And then the fourth point, uh, inequality. Uh, I think if we look at Asia over the last 20 years, the poverty rate dropped dramatically from 52% to about 21%, so almost 30 percentage point decline, and something never seen anywhere else in history. <coughs> but while poverty fell so much, inequality increased for 80% of the Asian population. And therefore, we have seen, and it's not unusual to see within a rapid period of growth, inequality growing, but I think there are reasons to have that very much present. And I think as the Arab Spring has taught, inequality, especially if it's associated with high levels of youth unemployment, can be a recipe for significant political change. And therefore, it can be an important factor. So these are the four things I would like to talk about. So let's start with climate change. Climate change, one thing that many people don't realize is that if you take the G20 group of economies, and of course you know there was going to be a G8 summit here because before it was hijacked to Camp David, but if you look at the G20 summit which will happen in Mexico in June, you take the emerging economies of those G20s, the nine, made, the nine biggest economies of those emerging economies in G20s now account today for half of the global emissions. If you take the four Asian economies within those nine, which are China, India, Indonesia, and Korea, those economies account for 90% of that half. So essentially, this is why I believe that the battle for climate change will be lost or won in Asia. Now, if you go for a business and usual trend, which basically means that all countries will continue with the current pattern of uh, carbon emissions and energy consumption, the prediction is for a five degree centigrade increase in the global temperature by 2050, which would mean a sea level rise of 46 centimeters. 46 centimeters is about this much. So basically, we'd be up to our knees, especially those that are at the coast at the moment, in water. If you take all the developed countries of today, and you say the developed countries that have agreed to the Kyoto Protocol will fulfill their commitments, which is basically to reduce emissions by 80% by 2050, we will only increase temperature by four degrees centigrade. And therefore, the sea level will be five centimeter less in rise than it would be now. So instead of being above the knee, it would be right below the knee. But if we get all the large Asian economies, plus Brazil and Mexico, to also adhere to having uh, carbon emissions in 2050 lower than in 2015, 
then your expected uh, degree uh, rise is less than 3 degrees centigrade, and you go down to about 30 centimeters. Still a worrisome concept, but it illustrates how getting Asia and getting developing countries involved in the climate change battle is critical. And that's something that we, having as shareholders, both developed countries like the US, Canada, European countries, and the developed countries like China, India, Indonesia, find ourselves in the middle of this debate. Because on the one hand, we appreciate the request of our developing member countries to say, well, a lot of this is not due to what we did in the past. We cannot compress our desire to grow and benefit from industrial and economic development. But at the same time, we also have to convince them that they have to be part of the solution. Because if they're not part of the solution, there will not be a solution that's good enough for everybody. And one specific issue there is, is energy consumption. I mean, climate change means many things, but it's largely CO2 emissions and it's largely uh, uh, energy consumptions. And therefore, I think what is going to be important there is to have both a diversification of sources, we have an increasing move towards renewable resources, possibly nuclear as well, as a way of reducing the carbon emissions, uh, but also a reduction in the energy intensity. And a lot of the programs that we are doing now, if you look, for example, at our portfolio in China, we land about 1.5 billion a year in China, which is less than 10% of our total lending. But if you look at it 10 or 15 years ago, we were doing three highway projects, basically highways going west, to the tune of maybe $100 million each. If you look at our, pro our portfolio now, we do 10 to 12 projects every year, and there are projects in helping municipalities deal with uh, environmental issues, helping shape up uh, energy conservation policy, having looking at addressing social concerns. So we have completely shifted the composition of our portfolio from growth to inclusive and environmental sustainability. Because by now, the Chinese can build their roads better than we can help them build, honestly. But where they're still looking for inputs and for suggestions is how to deal with the social and environmental issues, which until recently were basically swept under the carpet in the name of fast growth, but now are beginning to emerge as their population and as the China takes on their role in, in, in the global economy as a major player, also they see as having to, to address and respond to these challenges. So it's, it's a very difficult thing. Now to be, it's interesting to see if you look at the 2011-2015 plan, Already there is an, a, a proposal to reduce the, car, the energy intensity by 2020. Uh, carbon emissions are supposed to be lower than 2005 to 2005. And in general, China is embarking on a path to reduce energy intensity. Uh, energy intensity and total energy production, of course, is different. At the moment, China is the largest energy consumer and CO2 emitter in the world, has surpassed uh, the United States in 2010. But if you look at the energy intensity, energy per person or energy per unit of GDP, it's still quite a bit lower than the other. And the one thing that I think we can forget, and I'm sure most of you that are involved in manufacturing in the US are acutely aware of that, is that part of the shift in this energy consumption is a result of the so-called factory Asia phenomenon. One of the reasons why Europe and the United States energy intensity is declining is because some of the energy intensive production processes have been moved to Asia, and therefore their energy intensity is rising. So one has to look also at these manufacturing patterns to be able to eventually square up the issue. Uh, regional interconnection in that sense, and that's one of the things we try to promote as, as, a, as, a, as an institution in Asia, is an important element. We are working quite a bit in Central Asia, for example, trying to integrate the economies of the former uh, Soviet republics that have become independent. And studies that we have done show that these countries could easily save one and a half billion dollars a year in energy cost if their energy transmission lines were integrated. So that when you have a surplus situation in countries that have, for example, hydropower, you could export that to other countries. And then in the season, the dry season, when you cannot use the hydropower generation, you could use from countries that have thermal power generation like Kazakhstan and, and uh, Tajikistan, and, and move that capacity to generate onto the other countries. So regional integration is a way in which you can reduce energy intensity to the benefit of everybody and also reduce the level of investment required. Uh, but the other thing that will critically determine the energy intensity of Asia is urbanization. And this brings me to my second uh, challenge that I wanted to uh, point out to you today. Uh, 
as of today, 42% of the people of Asia live in urban centers, however defined by the respective national authorities. If you look at Latin America, it's 80%. So basically, urbanization in Latin America is a done deal. You may have movements in the margin. It's, I'm not saying that Latin American cities don't have their problems, but what I'm saying is that the shift from rural to urban has basically happened. In, in Europe, that's not the case. In, in, uh, in Asia, that's not the case. And what we expect, if current trends continue, is that about 60% of Asia will be urbanized by 2050. So going from 42 to 60%, combining it with the population growth that is expected to happen, means essentially 1.5 billion people moving from rural centers to urban centers. And we know that the cities and towns of the world are generating about 60 to 80% of the energy use because of a lot of the productive activities taking place there, a lot of the residential activities taking place there, and 60 to 80% of the CO2 emissions. So again, <laughs> urbanization links very closely to the pattern of energy consumption. Now, this is a tremendous challenge. Imagine yourself being the Chinese government and thinking about how you will accommodate that kind of shift. But it also brings tremendous opportunities to the region. Because one of the responses, of course, is to see to what extent you can rebalance economic growth. And when we get to inequality, we will see that a lot of the inequality in Asia is geographic inequality. What has benefited so much from the globalization process has been the coastal areas where all the productive activities have taken place. And therefore, incomes in the coastal areas have risen relatively to what their, rural, their income in the rural areas has been. So for example, if you look at the last uh, five-year plan in China, you have this great Western development movement. That's why the highways, the railways are moving west. And there is a conscious policy of trying to move some of the development to the Western areas as well. Part for reasons of equality, parts for reasons of competitiveness, because of course, wages are rising rapidly in the coastal cities. And therefore, China is also concerned whether a whole other range of countries, like the Vietnams, the Philippines, the Cambodias, will be eventually becoming the next place for the centralization of production, or whether their Western provinces can offer a credible alternative for them. So, so geographic shift at the national level, but even in terms of cities, having cities that are relatively compact and energy efficient will be critical for them to be able to be sustainable in terms of energy. And therefore, you cannot think of a growth pattern like, if you will, the United States sort of progressively taking over in a circular motion the area around the city, you have to think of cities on a hub and spoke system where you may have centers that offer both employment, entertainment, residential facilities connected on fast trans tra transportation links to up to the center of the city and possibly to themselves. And that way you can create the density that allows you to support the the urban mass transit systems that then allow you to provide the transportation in an efficient way, combined with the fact that if you mix residential uh, uh, residential uh, work and entertainment uses in a small location, then you also reduce the number of transportation that is needed to achieve this objective. So, so this, uh, this is why, if we look again at our portfolio, I always like to relate it back to, to, to the work we do, our transportation portfolio years ago was basically roads and highways. You know, they, they, they know the famous movie, you know, if you build it, they will come. Uh, it definitely works for roads. You build the road and development will follow. However, in recent years, mindful of, this, uh, of these constraints, we are realigning our transport portfolio to what we call sustainable transport. And therefore, trying to focus on urban mass transit, on rail, on inland waterways, on more energy efficient ways of ensuring the necessary connection. And then, of course, uh, in multimodal links when it comes to, to freight transportation. So quite a big push for this uh, development infrastructure. The second thing that's going to be critical, and this brings us to another one of our priorities, is, is the financial sector development. Because if you look at urban centers, urban centers typically have higher productivity compared to the rest of the world and therefore to the rest of the country. And therefore, they can actually generate revenue that helps pay back for an infrastructure investment that they need. 
but they will need to be managed in a much more professional way than many of the local municipalities and urban centers that at the moment managed in Asia, uh, and they will need a very high level of financial intermediation. Here you have municipal bonds. In Asia, we barely have government bonds. I mean, we have a, an Asia bond market initiative which is trying to develop local currency bonds, but, uh, but when you go down to the local municipality level, it's basically a segment of the market that's not existing. So that is a, an area where the financial sector will really need to play a big role, not only at the local level, but also at the national level, in intermediating the huge savings that Asia has and be able to allow them to be plowed back into, into the infrastructure investment. And, and that is where the private sector will have to play a key role in that. And I'll get to that at the end. But basically, no institutions like ours who think they're doing as good a job as they can can make a significant dent in the requirements, the development requirements of the region, unless we get the private sector heavily involved in all sectors, including infrastructure. Um, let me move, because the clock is ticking, to the third one, which is the demographic transition. Uh, and there, I would simply like to reinforce what I said. Demographic transition will take two shapes. One is going to be rural to urban migration. So it's going to be a transition within countries for given levels of population. But the second will be a transition in terms of age. And this will be a very un uneven transition. You have countries that have a still relatively young population. Think of India, think of the Philippines. Their uh, a median age now is 23 years. Uh, it will go up to 37 years of median age uh, in 2050, which is basically where Korea and Japan are today. So still not very old as a population. You have countries like China and Thailand, which is now 33 years old median age. They go up to maybe 45 that begins to raise some concern. And some of these countries, notably China, will be, of course, suffering from their one-child demographic policy at the time. It worked quite well to constrain demographic growth for a period. But as it works its way through the demographic pyramid, <coughs> it will have a significant impact because as the old age population grows and as life expectancy increases, then there will be fewer younger people able to support that population. Uh, and so, uh, I think some of these phenomena, which are the, uh, you know, do both to decrease in fertility because women attend secondary education more, because the marrying age is getting later, and so forth, and combined with the reduced mortality because of a health improvement, will really significantly change the landscape of, landscape of vision. Which means that there is a demographic window of about 20, 30 years when the governments of the region will need to find the policies to address this issue. And these policies will span a wide range of, of, of areas. One will be, of course, increasing labor force participation. Women's labor force participation is still pretty small, low in Asia, so this does potentially have a pool, a reserve pool of, of labor, which will be quite significant. Extending the working life, as we were saying 65 is going to be a notional retirement age, but nobody is likely to be retiring at 65, certainly not in many countries in Asia where the social security systems are still largely based on family support and not so much on, on a public system. Uh, you know, increasing productivity through education and capital intensity, uh, but also finding new ways of designing services in an affordable way. And in that sense, I think Asia has much to learn from both the good and the bad examples from developed countries now in how to design social security systems based not only on the public pillar, but also on private savings, social service delivery systems in terms of health, education for the third age population that look at a more decentralized and cost efficient way of providing the service. And then regional flows again. The regional integration element will be important. You have countries like Japan, which could certainly benefit from a, high, from a more liberal uh, migration policy bringing in younger population from countries like the Philippines that have an excess young population. And at the same time, to do that, you will need to have portable health and social security systems that not only serve you in the country where you work, but that you're able to move from country to country. Some of the things that European countries have started doing uh, before the, the, the current problems, something that Asian countries will have to think about. Fourth and final point, uh, inequality. Uh, inequality is a topic, I think, that is very prominent in, 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 the, in the debate this year. We have seen what happened in North Africa with the Arab Spring, 
Uh, you have seen stirrings here in the United States with the Occupy Wall Street and the Occupy movements in many places. And I've been in Washington for only a year now. But it's interesting, in the last few weeks, I've been to at least two events where the whole discussion about and discourse about inequality and what that means for the national uh, development and, and, and national cohesion, I think, has become a significant issue. Now, in the past, Asia has grown with relatively low inequality. And this has been due to a number of factors. Rural productivity went up quite a bit, thanks to the Green Revolution in many countries that basically significant raise, uh, rise yields and therefore made it possible for people in the countryside to improve their lot or to market-oriented reforms. If you think of Vietnam, for example, that liberalized agriculture and made it possible for people to retain many of the fruits of the <coughs> Small and medium enterprise base growth made it so that there was a much more diffused employment base. The rural urban transition was much more gradual. Many countries had socialist, fairly socialist policies in terms of health and education. Sri Lanka, the country where I was fortunate to be a country director, had very progressive, in that sense, health and education policies that made sure that everybody had access to, to those. So growth happened in Asia, but it happened slowly and it happened very quickly. But if you look at the period of the last 20 years, and you cannot exactly pin 1990 to 2010, but broadly around 1990 and broadly around the end of this decade, the GDP growth in Asia has been 7% per year. Poverty rate, as I said, has declined by 30 percentage points. But the Gini coefficient, which is a measure of inequality that measures from 0 to 1 the level of inequality, with 0 0.4 being a sort of accepted average range has grown from 39 to 46 for all of Asia. And for 11 countries out of the 28 we've been able to survey, but 11 countries that account for 82% of the population. So basically, for the majority, vast majority of Asia, inequality has increased. And now we see that the top 1% of the population in Asia control 6 to 8% of the expenditure. And the top 5% control 20% of the expenditure. Now, given that in the US the top 1% controls 20% of the income, that might not sound as bad. But we see this percentage increasing over time. And, uh, and we see also that even though Asia is still relatively less unequal than, for example, Latin America, the trend in Latin America has been declining in terms of inequality, whereas the trend in Asia has been growing in terms of inequality. And so this is something that concerns us. And why should it concern us, you may ask. I think it concerns us for two reasons. One, because we like to think we're a bank with a heart. And so our mission is, after all, poverty reduction, social development, dignity of the people that live in our region. And therefore, seeing poverty and seeing inequality is something that concerns us. But I like to think it's also because we're a bank with a brain. And so we, like to, we see that inequality can have negative effects on economic. Inequality can rob our countries of productivity. If people in the lowest quintiles of the population have no access to finance, have no access to education, they will not be able to realize their full potential. And by doing that, they will not be able to realize the potential of the growth of the country. If Steve Jobs, if uh, Bill Gates, if the people in the United States have not been able to have access to technology, to finance, to talent, they will not be able to develop companies that have been successful and are propelling the economy today. We want the future build, uh, jobs and gates and the young people of Asia to be able to take advantage of that and bring the growth further. But also I think in, uh, inequality can generate in, inefficient policies. If you have inequality in the country, you will have governments that are tempted to put into effect suboptimal populist policies to keep the people at the lower end of the spectrum content. You will have food subsidies, you will have gasoline subsidies, usually generalized because they're very difficult to target, and that will create a significant burden on your fiscal budget and will not necessarily be the best use of scarce public funds. At the same time, you will have corruption at the higher levels, you have people in the higher percentage of the population, the ones with highest income, that will try to defend their position, and they will try to do it through many, many means, not all of them above board. 
And then final point is uh, inequality can hollow out the middle class. If you have more people at the top, more people at the bottom, and less people in the middle, kind of the apple after you've been away in the court, what that will do is that it will deprive you of the stability that the middle class brings you. And what economic research shows is that you need inequality to ignite growth. You need inequality to, to get and kickstart the growth process. But you need stability and relative equality to keep the growth going. And therefore, if we're looking at a steady process of growth in Asia over the next 30 years, that's where equality comes in for. Now, what are the causes of this inequality? Uh, I would highlight three briefly because they are same causes that to some extent you might be facing here in the US. One is technological change. We see that as higher technology has moved to the productive structure of Asia, there's been a skills premium. And therefore, people with a college education can often get a 70, 80% premium in income over people with a secondary school education. And if we measure it approximately, we have calculated that between 25 and 35% of the inequality in our member countries can be explained by difference in educational attainment. So technology has brought the skills premium. Technology also has brought a reduction in the share of labor. We think about jobs lost by the United States to the decentralizing of manufacturing in Asia, but the truth, and it is true, the United States went from a labor share of 65% to a labor share of 52% in the industrial sector. But if you look at countries like China and India over the last decade, the labor share in, in manufacturing in China and in India has also decreased. In China, it's gone down from 48 to 42 percent. In India, it's gone from 37 to 22 percent. So we see the same phenomenon playing there. And part of the reason is that with the inflow of foreign investment, the same technologies get transferred to countries that are relatively labor rich. You would expect you use more labor and less capital as you move your production from the United States or Japan or Korea to Vietnam or uh, China or Philippines. But the truth is, if you have developed a production process and you have quality concerns, in the, in, in the automobile industry, this is a good example, you will find Hyundai producing in China with very similar technology that Hyundai uses to produce in Korea. And therefore, this means two things. One, that the, the share of capital increases and the share, of, the share of labor goes down. Two, that the advantage that China is supposed to enjoy from its low-cost labor is not there anymore. And that's why you see some of the reindustrialization taking place. That's why you see GE bringing back some of the applying construction to the United States. Because at the point where the technology is fixed, then being closer to your market becomes, again, more important than being close to the cheaper source of labor. So the technology has changed this quite a bit. But by making the share of labor lower and the share of capital higher, it also increases inequality because capital is much less evenly distributed at labor. All of us have two hands and two legs and can do the job. Not all of us have the capital that will generate the dividends and the returns that will make it possible to benefit from that. So this has created uh, a, 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 a more polarization. The second is the market reforms that have allowed these processes to take place and, and uh, this, this openness to trade, labor flexibility, and so forth. And the third has been globalization. By producing for export, many of these countries have concentrated their industrial sector, which has been one of the highest growing in terms of wages, in some areas, where it be the coastal areas of China, the coastal areas of India, key growth poles in other countries, the area around Bangkok that was so heavily affected by the flood. And so this has created a geographic polarization within the country. And this is something that Asian decision makers are very much aware. And if you look at the five-year plans in India, in China, in Indonesia, in Malaysia, almost in all the five-year plans in the last edition, you see mention words like harmonious society, quality of growth, uh, faster but also inclusive growth, inclusive and just development. So this concept that inequality is important and poverty reduction is important is really now beginning to get embedded in government documents. Now, what is important is that these government authorities don't throw away the baby with the bathwater. Market reforms, globalization, technological transformation have been critical for the growth that has supported Asia and that has supported poverty reduction in the last 50 years. And these need to continue. But I think there is a difference between the quality of outcomes, the income or the expenditure potential that people have, and inequality of opportunity. 
And so what countries need to do is to accept that can be inequality of, of outcome, provided that it is the result of the fact that people have put in unequal efforts, but not because they've had, had unequal opportunities. In Cambodia and Laos, if you are a child in the poorest 10% of the population, you're still 5% less likely to get them in primary school. If you are a child in the lowest 20% of the population in most Asian countries, you're still three times as high to die. You have three times as likely to die before your age of five than you are if you in, within the same country in the rest of the population. So this is inequality of opportunity. It's not inequality of outcomes. And so what we are advocating, uh, and this was in fact the theme of our Asian Development Outlook Report, which was just presented a few uh, days ago, we're advocating then policies that can help redress this inequality of opportunity. So you can look at fiscal policies that broaden the tax base. At the moment, Asia has one of the lowest tax bases in the world. 15 to 20 percent is an average ratio of, of fiscal revenues to GDP. The OECD average is 25 percent. Broaden the tax base, improve the administration, but also move from the broad-based subsidies of a populist fiscal policy to targeted expenditures. In the Philippines, we have been supported for a number of years a, what we call the 4P program. It's a cash transfer program. It reaches uh, 3 million out of 19 million households in the Philippines. We have first targeted the municipalities. Within the municipalities, you target the households that are poor. And you give them a subsidy of $12 a month, 500 pesos, per family plus about 750 per month per child who attends school. So if you have a family up to a, up to a maximum of three children. So you've got three children in school, you're talking about 22 plus 12 for the family, $34 a month. It's not a very huge amount. You get this money if, if you're pregnant, you attend pre and postnatal care, and your childbirth is attended. If you have a child age 6 to 14, if they take the worming pills twice a year, because you know that worms are a big problem, and that will affect nutritional status, and nutritional affects capacity to learn. And if you have children age 3 to 14, if they attend school 85% of the time. So this is one way of still transferring funds to the needy people, but in a way that builds up their human capital, because they have better health, better education, and they have better opportunity to participate in the development of the country now. This is the kind of fiscal policies that can be done with a relatively small expenditure if you're able. Spatial policies, uh, moving infrastructure to poorer regions, making fiscal transfer to the same regions, and, t and adopting a migration policies that recognizes the fact that rural to urban movement is inevitable. You're not gonna be able to stop it. The best you can do is try to manage it in a way that it becomes less disruptive. And then employment-friendly policies through development of the medium enterprises, removal of factor distortion, and labor market institutions that make it possible to have both the social safety net and the growth. Asia, in reality, has probably one of the most flexible labor markets, largely because it's either unregulated or untouched by regulation, because regulations <laughs> are avoided. But if you have a combination of flexibility of portable minimal health and social benefits, combined with flexibility in the labor markets, then you are able to improve the lot of the poorest, but at the same time maintain the flexibility that has been one of the key elements of the years ago. So in conclusion, I think Asia has a fascinating role ahead. I think there is really much possibility for this to be a continent that is able to eradicate poverty, reduces inequality, bring social development to most of this population. This is rich of implications for all of us, not only for Asia, because if Asia grows, and I think the, the, cri the economic crisis now is a good witness, this means that also developed countries will prosper more, or there will be a better trade partner. There, will, there is tremendous demand for growth, growth for demand, the growth in demand there, that will require production and export for countries such as the United States. But this growth has many policy challenges. We've touched on only four. When I come back next time, I'll give you another four. <laughs> there is plenty. Uh, but uh, this is where I think we really have a job to do. We, as an institution, are, as I said, are basically owned by you and by the governments of our member countries, both developed and developing. Our role is to try to advise the governments to make them aware of some of these challenges and constraints, to advise them on some of the policies that they can adopt, 
we finance, we finance about $16 billion a year. Now, it seems much to me, but if you look at the development challenge in Indonesia, $16 billion a year doesn't even register on the chart. So what we have to do is make an effort for this land, for this financing to be associated with demonstration effects that can make it possible for these countries to then replicate and bring to scale the kind of policies and intervention. And in this sense, I think bringing together public and private actors is a fundamental role. That's why I'm particularly happy that the Chicago Council gave me this opportunity today, because what is going to happen in Asia is going to be to rely largely on what the private sector does. Their private sector, but the private sector in other places around the world as well. We can create the opportunities for private sector involvement in, in infrastructure development, for the growth of markets where the private sector has a role to play, for the places where innovation that comes, yes, from publicly funded basic research, but largely by privately funded private research, is really what brings the innovation and the technology. So we have to be able to make that bridge between the private and the public sectors, between continents that have more of this technology and continents that have less, because it's only by doing that that we'll be help, helping Asia achieve its outcome and by helping them also help ourselves. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Pio. Um, now we'd like to go out to you. We've got a few minutes for questions. Yeah, right over here, please, in the back. I'm talking about how things might look in 2050. And to get where you want to go, you have to have so your executive summary, enlightened leadership. What kind of leadership do we have today? How enlightened is it to help us start getting that move toward 2050? You want a harmonious Asia, but right now, India and China are looking at each other. China's neighbors are a little nervous. There's North Korea. How's this all gonna come about? <clears throat> I think that's a critical question, <clears throat> and I think actually managing these transitions will, will depend on leadership. Now, uh, I think you, you, different countries have different situations, and I think we can generalize, but I think we are quite hardened by some of the developments we see some of our, I mean, the fact that most of the development plans, as I mentioned, are now enshrining this concept of inclusive and sustainability means that the concept has percolated to the leadership, that there are concerns about the demands that their populations make. Look at a country like the Philippines. Uh, Philippines is a very interesting example. We, our headquarters is based in Manila, and it was put there in 1967 because the Philippines was supposed to be the country leading growth in Asia for the next 50 years. Well, uh, that's not exactly being the case, but if you look at the, at the situation at the moment, you have a president has a, that has taken corruption that has taken making the role of the private sector feasible, that has taken making the investor environment a bit more predictable, you know, in a very slow, low-key mode, but in a very fairly steady way. So I think there are signs of, of growing awareness of the leadership of many of these countries. And I think some of the democratization process and, and of course openness to globalization has been a very important has plays a very important role in that because with openness to foreign markets also comes openness to foreign ideas. So I think it's a long road, but, but I think not necessarily, we're not necessarily going in the wrong direction, I would say. Okay, yeah, right here, please, in the boat. Wait yeah. for the mic, please, it's coming. Okay. That being said, what do you think the future of capitalism is and entrepreneurship, free, you know, free enterprise in this region? I mean, Arab Spring looks like going towards socialism. Everybody wants a piece of the pie, but nobody wants to grow the pie. Well, in that sense, I think the perspective in Asia is, is, is quite different. I mean, I think most of the, if you, I mean, the reasons why it's that way might be different. But if you look at the kind of things you normally want to support entrepreneurship, which is a relatively low tax regime, you broadly have that in Asia, either because countries have kept taxes low on purpose or because the level of evasion is so high that very few people are paying them anyway. But you could argue whether that's the best way to get there, but at the moment you have that. If you look at flexibility of labor markets, you have a segmentation in labor markets where you have maybe in some cases very protective legislation, but the reality of it is that most of that legislation is actually circumvented. And so you end up having a lot of flexibility in the labor market. Again, one could argue whether that's the best way to get there. But so you have a situation where in reality, 
relative freedom of, of, of combining factors of production and entrepreneurship in doing so is rather rewarded, I would say, in Asia. What is important is now to make the transition from sort of the Wild West, why this happens, to a, to a situation where factor markets continue to be relatively free, but in a system that is better regulated, that has better social safety nets, that has a better way of taking care of its people so that they are protected and they can be part of the gates. I think that's going to be the big challenge. But I think as far as an appetite for entrepreneurship, I think it's definitely Right here, please. Uh, Just can you wait for the microphone, please? As a small American investor, uh, which countries do you feel we can safely invest in their funds? <laughs> I think I will skip the answer. I'll give you a, a let's see, a more, but I think it, 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 it I don't think there is one particular country that say I invest my funds there. I think it's uh, you have to to be a bit more. I guess um, I, I think you, you you have to analyze the situation a bit more specifically, probably by sector. Or by, I, I don't think you could say I go to this country and I'm guaranteed any better returns. I think what you will see happening is that uh, at the moment, private sector and and private presence in the infrastructure development in many of these countries is going to be a very promising sector, simply because the demand is so high. And so the question will be mostly to find a vehicle, I suppose, that invests in infrastructure development in Asia. That would be my advice, more than the country specific. Uh, in which sector in which countries? <laughs> I, I would just look at the countries that are growing and providing <laughs> the rest of it. Yeah. Um, yeah, and we have time for one last quick question, please, for right here. Hi. Um, China and increasingly others have said that the ADB's loan policies and strategic guidance are reflections of certain sorts of national policies, national preferences, typically ours, rightly or wrongly. And China has discussed forming a China Development Bank. How much do you see institutional competition uh, affecting you? No, that's a possibility. I think you're referring probably to this uh, either China Development Bank or this BRIC uh, Development Bank versus you know, uh, India, China, and Russia. Um, I think two things I would say to that question. One is the governance of international institutions needs to continue to be reassessed as the economy, the international economy evolves. I mean, we know that in the World Bank, in the IMF, in our bank as well, there is questions for more voice in the G20 process more voice of the emerging economies. And I think that's legitimate. If you are an emerging economy asked to provide bailout funds for Europe, you'd also expect to have more voice in, in how these decisions are made, if nothing else, to make sure that these are decisions taken at arm's length and that therefore it's not because you have European leadership in an institution that Europe gets a preferential treatment. So I think that's a, a legitimate concern. On, the, on whether there will be institutional competition, there might be, but to tell you the truth, there is enough work for everybody because uh, the, the amount of, of, uh, of development finance that we're able to bring is limited. We have recently launched an ASEAN infrastructure fund, which is basically funded by the ASEAN member governments and ADB with the objectives of over time developing paper that is attractive enough and AAA rated that sovereign funds that are managing national reserves can actually invest their reserves there. And we can use that money to finance infrastructure in Asia. But it's going to be probably five years before we have reached that point, And no matter how many times we leverage, it's still going to be a minuscule amount. So I think there is plenty of room for everybody. Thank you very much. Please join me in thanking Mr. Pio for his comments.